The Soul Reaper. Written by Charles Swain. Narrated by Brett Schieber. A face that sends chills down the spine stared back at her. She ran through the underground cemetery with her pursuer at her tail. This must be a nightmare, she thought, as she leapt through the cemetery. He stepped ever closer, and Nancy screamed. He was the remnant of everything evil and terrifying, with his sharp bones protruding from his back, four bony, disproportional hands, and rotten flesh lying over the top of his terrifying eyes. waited for humanity to grow, and now it's harvest time. The creature thundered. Oh my god, Nancy blurted out. It can talk. She was petrified and backed away, but it was too late when she realized she had backed into a corner. Not yet I not. I have not earned the title yet. She was trapped. An unspeakable evil stood next to her, a creature too nightmare-inducing to exist, but there he waited. Streams of tears slowly rolled down Nancy's cheeks as the Vesper King approached and tilted her chin. I ask that you hold back your tears. There will be none left when the torture starts. What the hell do you want? She screamed. The beast inched closer, surrounded by an unbearable stench and a dense fog that seemed to hide his feet. He moved swiftly, with his feet levitating in the air. To hear your cries carried on into the afterlife, and your hopes of passing by heaven's gate fade into obscurity. In this underground cemetery, the skeletons were used as the mortar to structure and support the walls. The skeletal remains detached itself from the walls. It reached for Nancy and grabbed her arms, and two bony hands held her feet. The creature stared at Nancy with ruby blood eyes. You now have my permission to scream. As the hellish beast spoke, he gripped his weapon, the Kaiser Blade, and in one swing he cut off her left arm. It happened so fast that she needed a moment to let the event sink in. After staring at her own chopped arm, her violent yells became apparent to the world. The creature closed his eyes and silently enjoyed her pain. Nothing was so divine as to let life be destroyed just so it could be reborn. She struggled to break free with the only arm she had left. The monster waited patiently for another scream, and when the scream was made, he opened his eyes and gripped the Kaiser Blade again. Yes, let the pain flow and release the instruments of your misery. He struck her with the Kaiser Blade again and chopped off her second arm. She screamed in pain and beckoned to be set free. She attempted to move forward, but her armless torso felt weightless and strange. She staggered forward and fell flat on her face. She had forgotten about the skeletons holding her legs down. Another bolt of pain sliced through her, and she managed to whisper, Let me go. The creature turned his head sideways as if it was considering her statement. That's exactly what I intend to do. I will let you go and send you to a place where your skin will embrace the flames and your pains will be pleasurable melodies to the death surrounding you. The creature then struck downward and cut through Nancy's skull. She became still as stone. Blood splashed on his face and trickled down his eyes. New bursts of energy flowed into him. Energy he got from his victims. Come, my legion. There is much work to be done. As he spoke, Vespers shrouded the beast in darkness. When they dispersed, the beast was gone. It was the high school's field trip for graduating students. 36 senior students made a three-day trip to a town in New Straitsville, Ohio. The town was known for its eerie and bizarre history, such as the ever-burning coal mine. 
Teachers explain that the fire burning beneath the coal mine was caused when a group of miners who were protesting for unpaid wages sent a burning car into the coal mine, and the fire has continued to burn beneath the burrow since 1884. The students were set to explore the town, demystify the truth behind the ever-burning coal mine, and get to the root of the cause of the fire. After each day's work, they retired to their lodge, which was not too far from town. Only Sean Mercer and Stacy Elstrom were really interested in the town's history. Others just wanted to have fun and evade schoolwork. All students are accounted for except Nancy Davis, Fred Douglas, one of the three teachers supervising the trip, announced. The teenagers knew about Nancy's behavior and were supposed to cover up for her. She said she was not feeling well and stayed back at the lodge, Owen Conrad responded. In reality, they knew her game. She left the lodge to be alone. The students learned about the origin of the mines during the day and returned to the lodge. Most were making chatter and having fun while a few were engrossed with searching the internet for more information about the mine. Kevin Baker and Stacy Elstrom were Sean's best friends since childhood. Stacy was a bookworm, while Kevin acted like a smart aleck. This place is damn boring, Owen exclaimed. No one ever died from boredom, Kevin responded. It's better than having to sit in that goddamn classroom to learn. I'm just suggesting that Nancy may be right, Owen continued. She's probably not going to come back until the day we're supposed to head back. There has to be a club around here. It would be fun, fun all the way. Guys, do what you want. I'm out. Owen made his way out of the building. He was always lively and hated any form of boredom. I have to get some fresh air and locate a club, he thought as he walked to a nearby park. Little did he know that in the thick darkness, the lights from the shade of indigo were watching him closely. He strolled across the park and sat on one of the benches. Owen took out his cell phone and began to text while his other hand was on the wood. Unknown to him, a vesper had coiled its legs around the park bench. Teeth like jagged steel emerged between the gaps of the wood. When it closed down, three of its fingers were lost forever to the world. Blood spouted as Owen yelled and tried to get up. The armrest clung to the other hand, and he was frantic enough to break away from the armrest. Immediately, he burst into a mad run as his adrenaline surged wild. He shouted for help, but no help was coming. This wasn't a fairy tale. The town knew better than to come outside when the Vespers were out. Owen ran frantically out of the park with his heart in his mouth. He ran over to the bridge. As he was crossing, the stone began to crack, and he fell through. He landed in the pond below and whimpered and swam desperately ashore. Once ashore, he stood and continued to run with his wetness making a trail behind him. He got to a part of the park that had a track and a small section for the gym, but no one was in sight. He kept running until his lungs collapsed. At last, he stopped to catch his breath. It was then he looked up and saw a figure he could only describe as hideous. What the hell are you? Never mind, I don't care, I need help. I lost a lot of blood. Not nearly enough. What are you talking about? I'm in a lot of pain here. Owen tried to get a better look at the creature, but felt a bar rail bind his hands and feet. As much as he struggled, he could not move. Even when I finish with you here, your pain will not be fleeting. I have centuries to discover all the things you fear. What have I ever done to you? Who are you and why are you doing this? There was a long pause, and the creature smiled in satisfaction. Because my appetite is never satiated. Owen, there is a scarcity of souls. As I indulge in your agony, the curse that keeps me confined will be lifted. As you die, so shall I be reborn. In a single swing, the creature struck Owen, slicing him in half from the skull straight down. Blood splashed and showered the rails as the two halves of the body fell to the ground. A faint glow came from Diomedes. He became visible for just a brief moment, and then went back to his translucent form. The time has almost arrived. Just a few more souls. Come, my legion. Watch as the world trembles before me, for oblivion is at hand.
Kevin, as well as many of the other students, were fast asleep. However, Stacy and Sean stayed up, trying to find out whatever information they could draw out about the town and the coal mine fires. Have you found out anything? Sean asked. Yeah, I found out that if Google doesn't have the answer, then this town must have some really discreet and hidden secrets. I'm serious, Stacy. I'm not kidding, Sean. Listen, if we want any information, we will have to ask one of the residents who still live here. I want the answers just as much as you do. Just be ready if it's something you are not prepared for. Trust me, I can take it. Just as Sean said those words, a knock sounded on the door, causing him to jump out of his chair. Don't look at me like that, he said to Stacy. I was just testing my reflexes. Stacy shook her head and laughed as she walked over to the door. When she opened it, a boy who couldn't have been older than ten was standing in the hall. Uh, can we help you? she asked. You all should leave. Leave now before the Vespers find you. What in the world is a Vesper? Stacy inquired. Spiders! Giant spiders with human skulls on their backs! The boy answered with fear evident in his voice. All right, who let the psycho kid into the room? Kevin demanded as he rose from his sleep angrily. He got to his feet and showed the kid the door. I believe they have some shrinks in the town right over. Best of luck with your mental issues, kid, he said as he shut the door in the boy's face. That was completely uncalled for, Stacy shouted. It's two o'clock in the morning, Kevin said. The kid wants to talk about campfire stories, and we're all trying to sleep. Who is the rude one? It isn't my fault he never got proper parenting. I will apologize tomorrow when I wake up. Kevin walked back to the sofa and attempted to get some sleep. You have to leave. They will tell Diomedes where you are. He will wait till night and come out of the coal mine. The boy persisted as he banged on the door. One of the teachers stepped in and had authorities send him away. What a pest. Trying to scare us so we won't explore their town tomorrow, probably, Sean murmured. There might be some truth to what he is saying, Stacy said and tilted her laptop for Sean to have a better view. Diomedes, the name is Greek and means evil king. In medieval times, this says the king was power hungry. He didn't even have executioners because he preferred to do the torturing to his victims. Diomedes even killed his own wife and daughter because he thought they were too weak to rule by his side. What does this have to do with what that crazy kid was talking about? I'm getting to that, Stacy retorted. She scrolled down the webpage and continued to read. Look! This talks about the Vespers. The king placed a curse upon the village upon his own death, turning them all into spiders with skulls on their backs. Their souls belonged to him to be tortured into the afterlife. She looked at Sean. They also have the power to bring inanimate objects to life to help Diomedes in his quest, whatever that is. He uses them as his eyes and ears. Whatever they see, he sees. For what? For hunting. Sean regarded Stacy in disbelief and said, Okay, good night. Oh, and a word of advice? Don't believe everything you read on the internet. I thought we were researching, Stacy said disapprovingly. Yes, we were, and it was fun until you bought into this ghost demon story. I want to find out about the whole coal mine fire, and you want to talk about fairy tales. No, Sean, I think both of these coincide. The coal mine fire. Maybe it awakened him. If he's dead, then he needs a place he can hide in the daylight. He might be living in the mine during the day hours and do his hunting at night. Sean thought Stacy was crazy, and he regarded her with mouth agape. When he finally found his voice, he said, Uh, no. Have you seen coal mine fires? It's probably hotter than the planet Mercury, easily exceeding 1,000 degrees, not to mention the lethal amount of carbon monoxide. How on earth do you think he would survive all that? He's a ghost, Stacy exclaimed. Heat and poison have no effect on ghosts, which is why it's the perfect place to hide. He can go where no one else can follow. You see, this is what happens when you suffer from sleep deprivation. Let's go to sleep and do some real research tomorrow. Sean turned around and was about to go to bed when he noticed Kevin wasn't on the sofa. Where did he go? He thought to himself. Just more road. It looked like there were more empty homes around because many people abandoned the town after the coal mine fire, Kevin thought as he continued to venture through the darkness. 
He couldn't sleep after the ruckus pulled by the psycho, and Sean's arguments with Stacy was not helping either. Kevin wanted to sneak into one of the deserted houses and sleep until morning. Even the stars seemed to be avoiding this town tonight. Not a single one in the sky. Good thing Kevin brought his flashlight. Finally, he saw one house over a hill. He walked over and realized it didn't look like the neatest home. Parts of it were boarded up, but he wasn't picky. A few of the windows looked broken, and the house looked dilapidated. Man, I'm glad I had my shots, Kevin said to himself as he walked closer to the house. He took a step inside, and then another. There was much creaking and cracking as he walked into the cobweb-filled house. Kevin looked around the room randomly for a possible space to enjoy his night rest. Suddenly, he noticed a disturbing figure quietly sitting in a chair in the darkness. Oh, I'm sorry if I disturbed you. I thought this place was abandoned. I will just be going. Come back, Kevin. While you still have the option to die quickly, there is much suffering for you to bear. Almost frozen in fear, Kevin slowly turned around. How, how, how on earth do you know my name? Who are you? The dark figure stood up and walked out of the shadows, his face unmasked and a truly hideous form revealed. Your executioner, the figure voiced courageously. Immediately, the argument between Stacy and Sean flashed into Kevin's mind, but it was too late. This can't be real, he thought, but reality was going to prove to be his ultimate nightmare. He tried to run out through the front door, but it was sealed by vespers. Without thinking, Kevin raced upstairs. This only vexed Diomedes. I am not in the giving vein this day. Vesper surrounded almost all the rooms upstairs and revealed to the Vesper King where Kevin was. Kevin saw a cord on the ceiling. He pulled it down and a ladder dropped to the floor. He quickly climbed up and ran into the attic. When he pulled the ceiling back up, he detached the ladder and tossed it aside, not wanting the creature to use it. You are trying my patience! The creature shouted. You will die the slowest of them all. Kevin remained in his hideout, shaking in fear. He tried to stabilize his shaking body and prayed that the creature would just go away. Everything was dark and as still as death. Fog seeped in and covered the floor of the attic as something rose from the shadows of night. It was the beast. He was levitating off the ground, inspecting the attic, and the creature's minions searched with him. The beast walked over and studied a locker it saw nearby. Placing a clutched fist around the handle of his Kaiser blade, he wondered if Kevin could be in there. A violent and aggressive swing of the blade was heard, and it sliced the locker in two halves. A few guns and some ammo inside the locker fell to the floor, but it was free of any terrified human. Do you think me callous, Kevin? I am doing the work God should have done for you long ago. Accept your fate, and let the chaos within your soul manifest. The creature's head turned slowly. Some vespers crawled upside down over the ceiling while others scaled the walls. They all searched the attic with the beams of blue light emitting from their skull sockets. Kevin knew it would all be over for him soon. His heart would give him away. It was so loud that he almost wanted to scream and tell it to stop. The Vesper King saw an Iron Maiden in the room. Kevin's heartbeat got louder and louder as he heard footsteps now pacing about the room, followed by hundreds of legs crawling over. It didn't matter how long he stayed in hiding. The creature would destroy everything in that room until he found him. He knew he was there somewhere. <laughs>